today we get to start a new series, and it's creatively titled Summer on the Mount. If you've been in church at any time in your life, you know what it's about, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, nothing really in the Bible, I would say, calls us to a higher standard than the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount has inspired folks, even those who aren't followers of Jesus, to at least say, we, we like Jesus. There's something about Jesus that is compelling. It's inspired uh, folks to lean in to moral teachings and teachings about life and justice and mercy. And so for the next eight weeks or so, we get to jump into this really important text. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus's, someone, someone might say, kingdom manifesto. It's what does it look like when people together decide that they're going to live in the way of Jesus, the way of God, the vision that God has for the world. It's about a new way to be human. And so I want to set the scene a little bit this morning, and we're going to look at Matthew 5, verse 1. And Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is this sort of collection of teachings that Jesus delivered on a hillside. And in this set of teachings. We might call it the greatest sermon that was ever preached. I mean, this is just marching orders for life. So this is how it all starts. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up a mountain. He sat down and his disciples came to him. Now, this is a mountain, sort of. I want to show you a map here, actually. And uh, so Jerusalem uh, kind of this uh, area that generally was called Palestine in the first century and historically. Uh, we have sort of various regions that make up, you know, historical Israel. There's Judea, there's Samaria, and then up kind of to the north there is the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus spent most of his life in Capernaum, which is a small sort of area in the Sea of Galilee, or not in the sea, that'd be weird, next to the sea. <laughs> and what we have for the Sermon on the Mount is, you see my very creative circle there, that is kind of the location that this happens. Now, in 2014, I had the amazing opportunity to actually go to this location. And it, it's interesting because the Sea of Galilee is about... 25 meters below sea level. So it's a pretty low place. And the mountain that we're talking about is honestly only about 200 meters above sea level. So you can imagine that it's not a very high sort of vista point like you would imagine. It's more of a hill. Um, but I have a couple of pictures of my experience there. That's, that's me after uh, probably no shower for who knows how long and a couple of buddies. And uh, that is us on what is often called the Mount of Beatitudes. And we are sitting there, and you can see the friend in the white shirt. He's actually reading the Sermon on the Mount. And it was this beautiful, powerful experience. And you can see the Sea of Galilee in the background. I mean, it's just amazing. And what I remember about that experience is just sort of soaking in, wow, Jesus like just stood here. It was a common sort of hill. It wasn't anything special. He didn't build a giant monument in that moment to kind of, you know, set the stage. You know, he didn't have to do anything but just simply be there and people were compelled to listen. And what's really interesting to me is that, you know, he, he's going to say some stuff that is challenging. He's going to say some stuff that wasn't easy to hear. And yet, as we look at the life of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, we also know it changes. Human history changes everything. And by the way, I would love to go back there. So if anyone has a ticket, you know, you're just like, hey, let's go to Israel for a month. You know, just let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll gladly just escort you. Um, you know, I'll even take care of your kids. I don't care. I'll just let me go. Um, it's an awesome experience. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so anyway, imagine that you're one of these first century um, people who has heard about this traveling teacher. You're on that hillside. You're, you're sitting there and you're hearing him deliver this magnificent sermon. 
And he's telling a group of people that's kind of a hodgepodge of humans. You know, there's rich people there. There's poor people there. There's um, people that are Jewish by birth. There's people who have probably joined Judaism as uh, Gentiles and have kind of moved in that direction and now are hearing Jesus for the first time. And he says these words that are core to human flourishing. And you're sitting there and you're, you're noticing all of these themes about, wait, Jesus, you're saying it doesn't just matter what I do, although what I do matters. You're, you're saying that something happens inside of me that compels me to do those things. That's new. That's radical. That's, that's different. And so you're, you're sitting there and you're asking, okay, so how, how am I being shaped by um, what I'm putting into my heart? And how is that coming out of my life? And what if it were God that were giving me that shape? And so for the next couple of months, we are going to explore what does it mean to be human what does it mean to follow Jesus as his image bearers, as God's bearers of um, his love and light in the world? And we're going to look at words that are sometimes misunderstood, uh, sometimes resisted, and sometimes really radically life-changing and world-changing. And I, I want to just suggest that if you take up Jesus's teachings in the Sermon on the Mount as your sort of marching orders for life, if you'll take up these things that aren't always easy, but are always good, I want to just say that your family will never be the same again. Your coworkers will never interact with you the same again. Your friends, your neighbors, and you will never be the same again. And here's what I hope we can really talk about today as we intro this amazing Sermon on the Mount in our series, Summer on the Mount. It's this big idea. No matter life's lot, you can bring light. No matter life's lot, you can bring light. And, and what I mean by this is your, your lot in life, your situation in life doesn't determine your value. And we're going to really see this clearly today. We're going to look at something that uh, have been called the Beatitudes. And these are uh, traditional teachings. You may remember, blessed are the poor, blessed are the, right? And there's these teachings of Jesus that just turn reality and expectation upside down. And so what we'll see is that Jesus is naming something in people and it didn't matter where they were in life. It didn't matter if they had a lot or a little, if they were shamed by society or loved by society. Jesus saw that in them, they could experience and give off God's love and light in a powerful and real way. And so let's jump in. I want to jump in today and we're going to be out of order. So if uh, you are looking at Matthew 5, we read verse 1 that kind of introduces, hey, they're on a hillside. And then there's this chunk that are called the Beatitudes, and we'll get to those. But we're going to skip ahead first because uh, in Matthew 13, or 5, 13 through 20, the second half of our passage, uh, Jesus really gives sort of the vision for what he's saying and why he's saying it. And then we'll go backwards, okay? You ready? Okay, so here we go. Matthew 5, 13. This might be familiar to some of us. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how will it, excuse me, how will it become salty again? It's good for nothing except to be thrown away and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on top of a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven." I'll pause there and simply say there's something really awesome happening in this passage, right? So Jesus says, look, you are the salt of the earth. This is probably something, whether you're a church person or not, traditionally, like the salt of the earth is kind of a casual thing we say. And, and, and 
it's fascinating because he'll say salt of the earth and then Jesus will say light of the world. And so I was looking at my, my, my Greek New Testament and trying to see like, are they the same word? Or are they not? And they're not. In fact, the, the word for earth is like earth, like sort of like where you lay your feet, right? Where you plant your feet on the ground. In other words, earth is very localized. Earth is where you go. Earth is all, sometimes the whole sphere of the planet, but often when it's in contrast to the word world, which is cosmos, it, it's sort of where you are, the world as you experience it, the land as you experience it, you in that space are the salt of the earth. You are the ones who can bring flavor and life where you go. But then he says, together, you are the light of the world. So when people look at you living in this way, your light is going to shine throughout the world. The whole world is going to see the way that you are loving God and acting. And they're going to say, we think that light has something good to offer. You know, it's not as dramatic as a bug kind of chasing a bug light and, you know, oh, life's good, life's good, boom, and it's not good, right? There's a lot of things that tempt us. <coughs> tempt us. There's a lot of things that tempt us. Yeah, some of you like the 13-year-old reference there. Um, <laughs> apparently, that's my, my lot in life. Yes, and, and uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things that we think are light, we think are good, and they draw us there. But when we get there, like that poor little bug who's about to get zapped, right? Like, we just realize... This wasn't all that it was meant to be. But when people are following the way of Jesus, that light, that warms reality, God says, this is how the world should be, and people are going to be drawn towards it. And so this, my friends, is the vision of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, look, wherever you go, you're going to add flavor. You're going to add goodness to those spaces and when you do that together, you're going to actually light something so bright that the outside is going to want to come in and see what's going on. There's another big thing that Jesus says here, and so we'll, we'll kind of keep going here. Verse 17, Jesus says, Don't even begin to think that I've come to do away with the law and the prophets. I haven't come to do away with them, but to fulfill them. I say to you, very seriously, that as long as heaven and earth exist, neither the smallest letter nor even the smallest stroke of a pen will be erased from the law until everything there has become reality. Therefore, whoever ignores one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called the lowest in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps these commands and teaches people to keep them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I say to you that unless your righteousness is greater than the righteousness of the legal experts and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. A lot there. I'm going to summarize because we have a lot more to cover this morning. But simply, Jesus is saying in a lot of ways, like, hey, when you see me, when you see how I do the life with God thing, when you see how I do the living, the Jewish Torah, the law out, you are seeing exactly God's heart for how this thing was supposed to go for Israel. When you look at me, you are seeing, and, and in fact, Jesus is the clarification for what is actually the deepest heart of God from anything that came before it. That Jesus, when you look at Jesus, you get the clearest picture of God. You get the clearest picture of the intent of what the whole Bible has been talking about. And it's not uncommon for a first century rabbi to talk like this. Uh, you might remember other passages where Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, right? And it's this image of w kind of an ox having a yoke and sort of bearing the load of their master. Well, in the first century, that was a metaphor for the way that people would talk uh, to their rabbi, if they had a rabbi, a teacher. And, and that rabbi would say, when I come to the scriptures, my yoke looks like this. In other words, the core of my teaching looks like this. And Jesus will define that elsewhere as love God, love your neighbors, right? 
And so every rabbi in the first century has a thing that they're bringing to the table. And Jesus says, look at me, look at how I do it. I'm not here to abolish what came before me. I am the continuity and the fulfillment of it. And so follow me. Remember, these words are to a Jewish community, right? And so they have a very particular way that they're holding this moment. And later on in the New Testament, as non-Jewish people, like many of us, join the Jesus movement, then they will have clarity about what it means to do this as non-Jewish people. But what's great about the Sermon on the Mount is that it's applicable to anyone who follows Jesus. We following? Right, so some of this is just context to sort of set us up to really understand what's going on here. And so, here's probably the big idea from this passage so far, is that Jesus clarifies God, God's heart for how to shine brightly as his image bearers. Jesus wants us to know that he clarifies God's heart. And, and when we say image bearers, we're going back, of course, to who is a human after all. Well, God made humans in God's own image. God wants us to reflect God's love and light to the world. And so Jesus says, look, I'm, a, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I'm about to show you exactly what this looks like. And so back to our earlier point, and we're going to kind of transition a little further here, is that no matter life's lot, you can bring light. You don't have to be a religious expert, Jesus says. In fact, the religious experts aren't always doing it very well. He says, you, you could do better than the religious experts because many of the religious experts of the day were about, hey, look at how good I am at this. Look at how I've put it all together. I, I follow God perfectly. I am this shining example of what all of you should be. And Jesus says, no, they're not. They're the shining example of how to have a list of rules added to a list of rules and trying to just put up appearances without having the heart and kind of character that God wants us to actually have. And so Jesus looks at this community of people who would never make it as a religious leader, who would have been sort of on the outside. Some of those leaders would have said they're unclean. And Jesus looks at them and says, you have potential to do it better than they. And in fact, I expect you to do it better than they do it. And I'm gonna clarify exactly why they do it wrong and how you can do it better. And so we go backwards a little bit and we're gonna talk about these beatitudes. And, and beatitudes are, again, these sort of statements where Jesus will say, blessed or happy is the person who, for they will get this sort of reward later, right? And a couple of helpful quotes, I think, that really set us up here for understanding what we're about to read. Uh, one comes from a scholar named Glenn Stassen, and he said this about the Beatitudes. He said, the Beatitudes are not about high ideals, but about God's gracious deliverance and our joyous participation. I, I want us to hear that. The Beatitudes are about God's deliverance. God is doing something to deliver people, to bring freedom to people, and we get to participate in that now and at the end. He keeps going. He says, Jesus says we are blessed because God is not distant and absent. We experience God's reign and presence in our midst, and we'll experience it even more in the future. Dallas Willard adds this that I think really frames it up for us really well. He said, the Beatitudes are good news because they are a declaration of the presence of the kingdom in lives where people didn't think it was present. Have you ever felt like you were in a situation and you didn't feel like you should be there, like you weren't worthy of the situation? Or, or have you ever found yourself comparing yourself to other people and saying, you know, they're so pious. I wish, I wish I understood God like they do. I wish I had those gifts. I wish I was more like. 
Jesus says, but you need to start noticing the unexpected reality that I might actually be working in and through you in a unique way, in a way that maybe is unexpected. And so I want us to sort of wrestle with what is he doing then as we go back to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount and listen to these iconic and powerful teachings of Jesus together. It says this in verse two. He taught them saying, happy are people who are hopeless. Other translations that you might be familiar with would say poor in spirit. We'll talk about that. Happy are people who are hopeless because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are people who grieve because they will be made glad. Happy are people who are humble because they will inherit the earth. Happy are people who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness because they will be fed until they are full. Happy are people who show mercy because they will receive mercy. Happy are people who have pure hearts because they will see God. Happy are people who make peace or are peacemakers because they will be called God's children. Happy are people whose lives are harassed or persecuted because they are righteous, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are you when people insult you and harass you and speak all kinds of bad and false things about you all because of me. Be full of joy and be glad because you have a great reward in heaven. In the same way, people harass the prophets who came before you. So this is a lot of very interesting sort of contrast. Blessed are those who are hopeless for the kingdom is yours. And what I want to do is I want to break them down. And um, I sometimes find that when I write with a pen, I'm a little bit more like just, I'm tapped into something different than when I type. Do any of you get that? You know, some of us in modern times, we type so much that uh, we, we lose touch with just like pen and paper. And so um, I, I was sort of sorting this out. And so you're going to see this on the next slide a little bit because I want us to have a framework, right? So I didn't know how to make that in PowerPoint without trying way too hard. So this is the best you get, okay? And it gets better, don't worry. Um, but, but here's the frame. Here's what we're looking at. We have happy, joyful, blessed. These are all terms that are trying to capture a Greek word that has been historically sort of hard to translate. But joyful or happy is probably a good word that sort of helps us understand. It's not a state of um, you are being actively blessed, like you're getting something per se. It's actually a state of existence. You are experiencing inward joy and satisfaction because of dot, dot, dot. And then it talks about current reality. So sometimes we've sort of interpreted these uh, beatitudes as though they're ideals that we're supposed to strive for. So we sort of spiritualize them, right? So poor in spirit means something like humble. Well, as our translation today said, it actually has to do with hopelessness because you don't got nothing, right? So, so like each of these, what we're going to see isn't really about like some spiritual ideal that we're now instructed to aim for, but actually Jesus looking on the hillside, looking at this mishmash of people and saying, hey, those among you right here, there are some of you who are hopeless. Current reality is you're hopeless or you're humble or you're poor or you don't have what you want or you've got a pure heart. Here's current reality. And guess what? There's deliverance on the other side of it. There's goodness on the other side of it. There's a reward on the other side of it. And that reward isn't something just for the future. In fact, you can experience a taste of that future reward right now, which then dot, 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 is why you're happy, why you're joyful. Does the visual make sense? A little bit? 
A little odd? One person maybe? It's okay. It's okay. We're going to try. Okay, so check this out. We'll go to the next one. Yeah, it's, yeah I told you it gets better. Um, yeah, so Jesus says essentially, you're happy. You're fortunate. You have something to offer reality because you're poor and you're hopeless right now. But guess what? That's not the final state of affairs. The kingdom will be yours, right? So Jesus doesn't say, strive to be poor and hopeless. Although we've done that with this for some reason, like, hey, here's a great sermon. I'm gonna come up here and say, look, you should all do your best this week to learn how to be hopeless. And you're gonna say to me, that's not good news, right? No, no, no. Jesus is saying, there is someone in this, if I'm, I'm not Jesus, I'm pretending that Jesus is saying this, right? Okay, saying something like, there's someone in this church building right now who feels hopeless. Take heart. You can be happy because the kingdom is yours, right? Uh, next one. He says the same thing, like, look, you're grieving. I don't want you to be grieving because why, you know, it's not fun to grieve, but you can take heart. You're going to be made glad. In fact, the fact is that you are already being made glad in a unique way that's informing your fortunate, happy, joyful state without ignoring the fact that you're in pain. You following? Next one. Humble or meek will inherit the earth. In other words, hey, you are broke. You got nothing in your bank account. You got nothing to your name. You're of humble means. People look at you and say, oh, poor, poor so-and-so. And Jesus says, you're going to inherit the land. Like, you don't, you don't just inherit just a little bit. You, you get the whole thing. So experience the fact that you are God's heir right now. And that means you matter. You are special. So be fortunate, be happy. We've got another one. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they're gonna be fed. I love that translation, fed until they're full. You know, that, that feels good, right? Being fed until you're full. And, and here's the deal. Uh, this is an image where Jesus is looking around and he's saying, look, not only are you poor, not only are the religious elite people making conditions in Israel hard right now, but there's also the Roman army is all around us. If you've seen the show, The Chosen, you see this in action, right? There's Romans around, there's fancy religious people around, and then there's poor people. And, and, and this is their lot. And so hunger and thirst for righteousness, this is like righteous justice. This is a word that really goes at the heart of things don't, uh, shouldn't be this way, and a day will come when they're not this way. If you're hungry and thirsty for things to be made right, one day you're gonna be so full and so just overwhelmed by the goodness and justice and righteousness, right making of God, that it is going to deliver you from your current situation. But even in the situation, our dotted line goes back, you can be hopeful, you can be happy, you can be blessed, you can be sort of satisfied as you wait for that day. Next one, mercy, get mercy, right? If you want to be a person who is um, compassionate right now, if you're, if you're a person who shows mercy when it's unwarranted, Jesus says, well, you're the kind of person that God's going to lavish mercy on in the end. And in fact, it's the mercy of God that probably informs why you're merciful. So not all of his examples are like, your lot in life is terrible and negative. Sometimes Jesus names good things that are happening amongst people in his crowd. There's someone in the room who is merciful. Next one. There's someone amongst Jesus's um, community who has pure hearts. You know, the heart of, like David, a, a heart after God's own heart. And Jesus calls that out and says, look, you're going to experience God in a way that you can't even imagine. And even here and now, that reality is going to inform your disposition towards the world as someone who is joyful, happy, blessed. Next one. Peacemakers. 
Can you imagine needing to be a peacemaker in Jesus's world? I mean, can you imagine the, the fact that fights would probably break out amongst people who are trying to figure out how to feed their family or feed themselves? You can imagine the, the Romans being there and, and Jesus says, look, you step in and you're part of the solution to the brokenness. You're a peacemaker. God sees that and says, you're God's children. If you're a peacemaker, you're emulating your father in heaven who wants to make things right. And that makes you hope, or, uh, happy, blessed, joyful. Even if you're persecuted, even if things are going wrong, the next slide, um, you know that in the end, God's kingdom is there and it is for you. And when you're insulted, because Jesus is looking at them and he's like, look, I know you're going to be insulted. I, I'm not a popular person to follow. You know what I mean? Jesus is like, I know that it's not going to end well for me. And you following me is risky. People are going to speak evil of you. They're going to mock you. They're going to disown you. And Jesus says, but the reward that you'll get in the journey and at the end of the journey, I guarantee is worth it. You can be glad, you can be blessed, you can be happy, you can be joyful, even if your lot in life is hard like that on account of me. Because here's the deal, friends. God empowers us in our real situations. God empowers us in our real lives. And it makes us wonder, like, what would be in the blank if I went through this exercise? Like, what would Jesus say of me in that scenario? And here's what I hope you'll notice, is that Jesus sees something in regular people that we don't always see in ourselves. That's the big second point there. Jesus sees something in regular people that we don't always see in ourselves. Maybe we could imagine Jesus saying something like this, blessed are the single parents for the presence of God is yours. Blessed are those struggling to find work for God is at work on your behalf. You see, the, the reality is, is that Jesus could step into this room, give the Beatitudes, and they would probably have some overlap to what they were for his first century audience on that hillside overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And then he would probably improv a few of them to be unique to your situation, to my situation. Do you follow? Jesus names reality and says, reality doesn't determine your situation. Reality, in fact, doesn't determine your ability to shine brightly. You can shine. No matter life's lot, you can bring light. And so I actually want to invite us to, if we can go back to that fill in the blank version of the slide. I want to invite you to look at the Beatitudes this week. And I want to invite you to consider how would Jesus, perhaps, and this is a creative exercise, you could pray through this, read the scripture through this, but, but what would Jesus name about your current reality? Maybe it's a hard thing. Maybe you are literally in a place where you'd say, yeah, I, I'm experiencing um, humble situation, you know, poverty, poor, struggling. And God's deliverance, what, what is that thing that I believe God would do in the future based on the Beatitudes? And then maybe it's not that. Maybe it's a character quality. Maybe you are, in fact, someone who has a heart for God, who has a heart that's doing all that you can to be formed after Jesus' love. And maybe in those moments, you say to yourself, you know what? Like, I, 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 I believe that, God, you're inviting me to have this pure heart, this disposition toward the world where I do all that I can to love people and love you with everything I have. And I know that somehow, some way, I'm going to experience you, God. But it doesn't have to be right out of the Beatitudes. Maybe there's something else that you believe is a fruit of God's presence in your life that you would say, you know what? I wonder if Jesus would make a Beatitude like this if he addressed it to me.
You know, as we close, um, you know, this idea that no matter life's lot, you can bring light. I, I was thinking about this, and uh, I recently read, and, I, you know, I'm not going to claim this is absolute fact, uh, you know, but I, I am under the impression that. Is that a good way to frame a, an illustration? Yeah, yeah, I'm under the impression that. Uh, scientists believe that the Earth's core is quite hot. Like, really molten hot. I mean, we see evidence of this from volcanoes, of course, and these sorts of things. But in fact, there's some studies that actually would say that the core of the Earth is similar to the temperature of the sun's surface. Isn't that interesting? That, that our little tiny planet compared to the massive sun that warms us and keeps us heated, at the core of the Earth, the temperature is similar to the hotness of the surface of the sun. You know what I think Jesus was noticing in people? That underneath whatever was on the outside, underneath whatever was going on that sort of, you know, people looked at and said, they're not enough, they're shameful, they don't matter, they're not impressive, Jesus looks at those people and says, you are impressive because deep under the surface, God is burning with love and passion in your heart and soul. And when that comes out for the world to see, there's nothing better. Jesus sees you. Jesus sees me and says, outside appearances are not the point. What's inside that shapes your actions, that is what this world needs. That is what your relationships need. That is what will make you light, no matter the lot you have in your life. So be blessed. Be happy, be joyful, because Jesus sees in you who are seeking after him all the potential in the world to shine brightly. Let's pray. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you love us, that you are generous towards us. And that you see all of the parts of who we are. You see the mess that we find ourselves in at times. You see the deep potential in our lives. You see our brokenness. You see our joy. And you say, you can follow me. You can be the salt of the earth. You can be the light of the world. Jesus, may we be people who truly take that invitation to heart. May we be people who trust that you are at work. Pray all of this in the strong, powerful, compassionate name of Jesus. Amen.